Hi, people. Very warm welcome from uh, our side. We're super happy to have you here in our online welcoming of our next batch. It's absolutely amazing um, that you are here, that we can do this online and onboard you and start the next journey with you. So super happy to have you here. I'm Benjamin, I'm the CEO of Zollhof. And my name is Chris, I'm the COO of Zollhof. And uh, yeah, we're really, really happy to, to guide you now, let's say at least for the, to the first uh, 10 minutes. And then we're gonna hand over to Niels who's gonna guide you during, uh, during this evening. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, I think some, some general administrative information. So you're all muted, that's already perfect. So please keep yourself muted during the, during the call. Otherwise we will take care of that for you. <laughs> and um, yeah, so basically we're gonna start right now, give you a short introduction, and then we're gonna hand over to Niels who's gonna um, guide us through the, through the whole evening. So for that, I'm gonna share my screen so you can see the presentation and then we're gonna give you an introduction into this evening and what we're gonna do and why we're doing the things that we're doing. All right, so um, happy to guide you through the first uh, information. Um, uh, we want to make sure that uh, you have an update on Solhof. I mean, you apply it, you probably know what you're going to expect. Um, just to give you some uh, numbers, some, some numbers, um, uh, that we just had. So we're now more than 35 employees at Solhof, people that will guide you through your journey. Um, startup experts, people that started new businesses, um, experts from all categories that will help you um, within the next months. We are actually now at our interim office and of course at the moment mostly online. So you will meet each other online, but um, we just started to re-enter our office at the moment. We're in an interim office in Nuremberg uh, with around 1,200 square meters. But I will show you some pictures and some insights on our next new building. Um, and that's basically why we're called Zollhof. Um, um, that's our Zollhof building that we will move in this year. Um, now with our fourth batch, we will have 50 startups that we are working with, which is actually quite a big number. Um, and I'm really proud um, that you now joining. Our startups collected roughly about 15 million uh, euros in investments, which is, I think, for this really early stage, uh, quite a good amount. Um, and of course, we want to bring together a lot of people, investors in our network and our startups and we had more than 300 events in the last years um, with more than 13,000 participants, actually. And if we're looking a bit closer into our ecosystem, I think that's really important for you guys um, to know who you're dealing with um, and what our network is offering uh, to you in the future. Um, so we're at Zollhof. Um, you can see our shareholders here that actually started Zollhof and um, are behind the company, are supporting ourselves. So there's Dieter Kempf, um, who was CEO of DATEV um, and is now leading the BDE, um, is the president for the German industries. Um, then we have the city of Nürnberg, who is one of our shareholders. Um, then the, of course, University of Erlangen, who kind of started the whole initiative. And then we have four great partners uh, and shareholders, which is Siemens, Scheffler, Huck Coburg, and Nürnberger Insurance Company. And those are the shareholders um, that support you uh, here at Solhof. If we then look at our partner companies, which we have a lot, I will have a slide about that. Um, uh, and if we look further, we have a big mentoring program. We have a huge network of investors. So starting from business angels to like professional VCs that we will connect you to. We have a lot of entrepreneurs in our network uh, that can help you. And of course, other startups that we work with. Um, we are the digital health hub for Germany. So we are actually connected um, you know, to the ecosystems in Berlin and Munich, uh, but also outside of Germany, of course, we have a huge network um, that we're working with. Uh, for example, Paris is one closer partner uh, in our ecosystem. And of course, the talents. Um, uh, so we have a lot of entrepreneurial talents that we work with. Um, that work um, as, as working students, for example, but also our, our employees at Solhof um, that will support you in the future. So just to give you, let's say, a little snapshot into our ecosystem. And to make it more precise, two examples. The first one is uh, about our corporate partners, which we're really proud of to work really closely with our corporates. 
um, that come from different industries. So as I said, we have four founding partners, um, Siemens, Scheffler, Hook, Coburg, and Nuremberg Insurance Company. But of course, there are way more really great partners that we work with. And a lot of them are here in the call today. So there is Energy and VAG as one of our partners. There is Adidas as one partner. There's Adorsis, I just saw uh, uh, one of the founders and CEO. So Sparkas in Nuremberg is one of our partners. The Nuremberg Fair and Novartis are the partners that we work with really closely. And then, of course, they're all happy um, to get connected to you and get to know you as well. And of course, we had a, wi a wide variety of supporters that we work with. So, for example, Flixbos or IBM, where you can, as a startup, get credits. They will support you uh, directly uh, with their software, hardware, or services. And to give you another example of our network, and I think that's really important for you as well, I think because that's just uh, also in my uh, own experience when you start your business, it's super, super important to have mentors, to have people that you know have been through this um, and made the journey and are now successful founders and these mentors, and this is just six of many, many mentors that we have. We have more than 40 in our network. Um, so as for example, Heinz, who is founder of Hotel.de, Caroline, founder of uh, SCKT, the Rocket Internet Marketing Agency, Daniel, founder of Flixbos, Christina, founder of Shift School, Matthias, founder of Cybex, and Michael, the founder of Design Offices. And we have many, many more startup founders, but also from the industry. So um, uh, there's a lot of variety for you. And I think we have a lot of really great experts that will guide you through your journey. So basically now you saw a lot about what we're doing in our network and basically who you're getting access to. Um, but I think one important fact for us, and I think this is what uh, you can actually see already when we look at our ecosystem, is that for us, we're not living anymore in like an either or world, but rather more like an as well as. So it's basically both things. Because I mean, in the past it's been like, hey, so have you digitized your business already? Are you completely digital already? we feel that this is not the complete truth anymore. Because as you see, uh, for example, we still have an old office space, so where people get to meet. And this is gonna be relevant in the future as well. So we rather see both things that come together and how can you more pronounce live the one thing or the other. So there will be always be a place for startups, but also for corporates. And where is the sweet spot how you work together? Same is in public and private. As you see, we're working with the university, which is basically helping us a lot via research, but also via talent and access to great knowledge. But on the other hand, we're working with private companies and individuals who basically then also make sure that things are executed and are brought to the market. So this is basically what is driving us and a strong belief of how we do things and why we do things. To give you also some additional information and show you like what we're doing and basically how successful we're doing, we have like say two comp KPIs that we want to share with you um, that basically show what great achievement has been made in total of just within the last three years. Um, so in the first place, we are number one in Germany's first fastest growing um, tech incubator when it comes down to employees and startups. So really looking at the numbers and looking down like, hey, this has been just three years that we've been, been, been supporting such a huge array of different startups from all over Germany um, in their journey uh, and basically growing to a team that really can facilitate this growth is something that we're really, really proud of. And additionally, and I think this is also a strong proof of seeing like the, the high demand last year for our batch, we had like 106 um, applications. But this year, and this has just been now, let's say the first half of the batch since we changed something from last year to, to this year, because we learned, of course, entrepreneurship is not just happening during three months uh, in the year, but it's happening throughout the year. And we want to facilitate that. So for that, we basically have now two intakes, one in May and also one in October. And now we've just seen that for this first intake, we roughly had the same amount of applicants as we had last year, which basically, if you look now, look um, towards this complete year, we will double the size um, and double the number of applicants that we're going to have. And we're really, really proud that you are the chosen ones that are joining us and that we can support during the next six months. To also give you some success stories of the companies that we've been supporting, um, that you see like this is the way that could, could go. And this is basically what all the Zollhof network and our resources and the know-how and the team uh, basically is able to, to help you. There's one, one slogan that I learned, which I think is also very true for us. We want to help you to punch above your weight line. 
to get really into an area where you get faster, where you really want to be, and actually also know better where you really want to go. And one of the proofs that we have is Car on Sale, which was a startup also in Solhof, um, which basically got uh, its first investment from, from the Zetsche, who um, is the former CEO of uh, Mercedes, and um, who basically then supported the growth, and it was basically his first investment. But this is the one side of the coin. Of course, there's investment cases, but there are also the bootstrap cases. And this is one of our first companies that we've been supporting in batch number one, Smart City Systems. They sold over 50,000 sensors until now. They have over 50 employees. They have large customers like Vodafone, EDK, Google, and they've been chosen for the German Accelerator program, and uh, which basically supports startups in entering the American market, which of course is, uh, let's say, <laughs> a pretty competitive program and which is really only keen for startups that are actually in the size that it makes sense to access the American market. And this has been all bootstrap company, so no external funding. Um, and this is something to also show you, hey, this is a very valuable case as well. So there is not only the VC case, but there are, there are different ways and different paths. And that's a very individual thing um, for, for every founder. And the third um, example that now has just recently uh, made themselves, let's say, an, an, an their name for for a specific app has been Climedo. Um, and there, if you just look into Handelsblatt and Süddeutsche Zeitung, um, they have been chosen by the German Secretary of Health to develop um, a quarantine app um, with regards to COVID, to track COVID um, and to really see hey, how are the flows of infection um, going. And this is also a strong case for them, I think, in terms of business, but also for us in showing, hey, we have really also um, startups that are, are, are um, going into a weight line that is really, really getting interesting. And of course, it's important for you guys uh, to know where this magic will happen in the future. And I'm happy to show you uh, the picture of the future itself. Some of you may know it, some of you have been to the construction site um, uh, it's fully ongoing at the moment, and uh, we plan to actually move in and finish uh, the construction uh, in September. So we will move in this year um, in our new office, and uh, there will be a lot of opportunities. Let's let's put it this way. So um, uh, you have, of course, space for your startup, but you also we will make possible that you can grow as a startup. So if you start maybe now with like three employees or like three founders, um, if you grow to like twenty or even thirty or more. Uh, we will actually have space for you because Zollhof is a 3,000 square meter office. Um, here's a glimpse into our uh, cafeteria um, where you can meet and chat. Um, we will have a lot of stuff in the office. We will have sleeping rooms. We will have showers. So I'm not going to say that you can live there, uh, but you can basically uh, work and get, get the job done. <laughs> so... This was in general when we've been talking now about Solov and why we're doing the things and how we're doing that. But let's say in the first next step, we really want to get down to what we're doing in our incubator program. And we always start, and I think you know a lot of things from, from the golden circle on why, how, what, which also guides our work, um, that we always start from a place of, of purpose and why we're doing the things that we're doing, uh, which you also really get to know uh, during the work with us and especially with, with Niels and Flo. Um, why are we doing it? And as you uh, might have read, our mission is to, to, that we want to make entrepreneurship happen. Because um, right now, there is you. You are here. That is your founder team. That is your team really at the beginning and figuring out like, okay, where do we start? Where do we go? And when we now are looking back in six months from now, our aim is that we are standing here and sitting like, you can say, yeah, we figured it out. So, but what means figure it out? And that I think is a very individual story as we have seen also in the cases with the startups that went different paths and we've seen it in the former batches as well there's always a different path but honestly uh, there's like a saying that says like clarity is power and for us this is actually where we really want to support you to have the clarity like which is the way that you want to go and where you want to grow and we will support you during that way um, that you at the end of the six months can really say great there is this next funding round that we just got in 
or we just said like now we found out that this is not the team that we really want to work with or we pivoted from this customer which we thought was amazing but until five months now did never pay in a euro a single euro so then we shifted to a different customer which really shows like yeah this is these are the people that are really looking for what we're offering and this is what drives us in our work and we will do and the whole team will do whatever is necessary that in six months from now you're standing here and saying like wow this is a complete different place where we're right now um, and this supported us on our journey to be successful. And um, yeah, thank you very much. And I'm happy that uh, I can hand over to Niels, who's going to guide you now through the how side of things of, uh, of our incubation program. Yeah, um, also a warm welcome from my side. And um, I will now share my screen with you guys. And um, maybe also a few words. And a warm welcome to the startups joining. This was um, a very, very interesting uh, application phase. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm here to guide you through the next six months. I mean, I'm ha very happy to, to do that and have you here. Um, here at Solo, the core DNA of, 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 of um, what we do is, is our incubation program. And as, as Ben has mentioned, um, we are here um, in eight fields to support you. Um, but besides the, the network and, and the mentor program, we'll be also evaluating your investor readiness and in order to match make you, we will do that during our business reviews. We'll, um, we're in the process right now with matching you with um, potential workshop partners and um, to those in-house of our startup program will be um, also sitting you down pretty soon. Um, the job pool is also another uh, big feature here in order to get um, also junior support quickly. And um, that is something we're super proud of here. Um, what does that actually mean, right? I mean, as we talked about, we were like um, splitting this year into two intakes. Um, we'll start with May and this is uh, about the corner and uh, we're kicking it off today. And this uh, does not mean that we are stopping here. And um, by November, we're going to have a new intake as well um, in order to increase our, our rate of incubation here. Um, we'll have five in-house startups um, and five fellow startups. What does that mean? The in-house startups are rather local and, um, and, and ready to incubate very closely. Um, the fellow startups um, might also come from from Germany or um, abroad. Uh, uh, so within these fields, um, the in-house startups, they are taking office space, the fellow startups were guiding remotely with um, everything you've seen um, in this eight fields of incubation. Um, this guides me already to the um, to the fantastic in-house startups we've gathered in, in four major fields of industry and um, I'm super happy to welcome um, Mentalis, a very strong um, mental health um, startup and in the mobility field, immobility and Movaco, Hoash in the IoT field and in the new media field will welcome dynamic video. And the fellow startups, there will be also very interesting um, topics coming up now from VIA, CityDoc, and Vertonomy. And I welcome also in the big data and I sector, Factual, and New Health. Um, <clears throat> we'll be having now a short look at our agenda now. And then the in house startups will be pitching quite shortly. We'll have a break after the five pitches. You're going to have the option to raise questions in the chat. Um, we'll be curating one or two questions per startup and then move on to the next startup. Um, also, the um, after the in-house startups, there will be a short break and we'll return to the fellow startup pitches. We'll also hear from um, someone who has launched a, a medtech business in Germany and um, thereafter will be a networking session. So if you feel like <clears throat> you've got questions towards a startup or certain startups, um, you've been sent um, invitation links to join certain networking rooms and there will be room for more technical questions and um, and also a networking option. We would love to facilitate you in, in our office. That's not possible, unfortunately, due to Corona, but this is our version of, of exchange. And um, 
yeah, therefore, I would be super happy to to welcome Mentalis um, to the stage, and um, and to have the first first pitch of of today. So hello, this is Jürgen and Joshua, Joshua speaking from Mentalis here. Hi guys. I will share our presentation now and uh, we'll turn off the video for the moment and we'll guide you through it. One moment. <clears throat> Can you yes. see the presentation? Yes. Perfect. Great. So, uh, hello, we are proud to be chosen to join at Solov, and we are happy to show you our product uh, today. We are Mentalis. Uh, we will challenge the burden of mental disorders for afflicted individuals and society. First, to give you a sense uh, for the problem, we want to show you some, in our, our opinion, very disturbing numbers. The average waiting time for outpatient treatment is at 20 weeks at the moment, although the direct cost of mental disease is 44 billion euros per year in Germany alone. To give you a, a further sense, 16%, so every six, six day, is due to mental health issues. And it is even expected that the problem will grow, that it will more than double by 2030. But what does that mean for the patient? How does the patient journey look? We show it to you here. The patient journey is long and tedious. It consists of different parts. There's prevention, there's outpatient treatment, and there's inpatient treatment. And one particular critical phase in this journey is after release from hospital. There, so the, the success of treatment is at risk, but why is that? Well, after inpatient treatment, patients usually need follow-up treatment but the lack of information of options for follow-up treatment. Furthermore, often patients have a lack of motivation because they just come from very intensive inpatient treatment and patients have a long waiting time at this phase. The result? Symptoms manifest and become chronic. Patients re-hospitalize. To give you a number, 32% of patients re-hospitalize within the first year. Or if they don't re-hospitalize, Patients may need longer and cost-intensive treatment. So, our solution to this problem is smartphone-assisted aftercare. It consists of app and coaching. The app offers low threshold access to therapy, it motivates the patient, and is evidence-based. The coachings offer therapeutic support if needed and can, if indicated, transfer patients to follow-up treatments. Our programs that we offer are, de are for depression, for alcohol, two very hot topics seen commonly in inpatient treatment, eating disorders, affect regulation, stress, and sleep. We've already had more than 1,000 patients in our completed or have them in our ongoing studies. And we have several partners, social insurances, universities, health insurances, and hospitals that value our missions, believe in it, and support us. Let's take a look at the potential for aftercare mental health in Germany. Every year, over 17 million people have mental health issues in Germany alone. 3.4 million of these seek help in the system, and there of 1 million patients are in inpatient treatment. We estimate the market potential, therefore, to 1 billion euro. The three factors we deem important for success are a low threshold. Patients need easy access to the intervention. In, in, in a intervention. We give that by uh, having the app on the smartphone. They need solutions that are evidence-based. Basically, the solution needs just to work and various disorders need to be addressed. In comparison to our competition, we offer much more aftercare programs at the moment. Well, where do you come from? Where are we going? 
We founded the company in March 2018. Since then, we developed our software and the programs. In May 2019, we received a, re a research grant in the amount of 400,000 euros. And at the moment, we are undergo undergoing medical device certification for our programs. Also, we are preparing uh, the registration of our apps as digital health products. And we are also talking to potential partners uh, for the future. We expect our first contracts with health insurances and hospitals to be closed in Q Q4 uh, of this year. From 2021, we expect, we expect first product revenues. Well, this is us. We look forward, forward to your questions and uh, we are looking forward to get you know, to get you know you better in our meeting room. Thank you guys. Um... Yeah, very interesting market you, you're operating in, and um, I feel it's it's quite a challenge. Um, yeah, how come you've chosen um, the focuses um, you did with, for instance, alcoholic depression? Is that something where you can see um, a big market? Well, in terms of focus, I guess um, the healthcare uh, system and the patient journey within it is rather complex and we see a lot of solutions, for example, for the prevention phase already, there's hundreds of thousands of mental health apps targeting, we, we call it Lifestyle Plus apps, uh, targeting, for example, uh, prevention of mental disorders. Um, the aftercare market, however, is very underserved so far because uh, patients are really sick. and companies, startups in the mental health sector so far are kind of hesitant tackling and targeting these kind of patients because they still believe that apps cannot help in these kind of situations given the difficulties and the symptoms of the patients. We, however, have conducted studies and have shown that our programs work particularly in this phase of treatment. So that's why we chose this market and this uh, focus in particular. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, feel free to, to add some questions or um, um, see the guys later in the networking room. Um, I would also um, probably question, yeah, feel free to, to ask the question. Let's see, we'll have... So yeah. what, what did customers value most about you and your product? We will we'll take that question and then we'll move on to immobility. Well, in our studies, we see that uh, patients are particularly um, thankful that we offer them a program, especially in times when they need something and don't have to wait for, let's say, 20 weeks on average. That's one thing they, they highly value with our product. The other thing is that we provide an algorithm-based personalized therapy plan. So in comparison with other programs on the market, you don't have, let's say, 10 modules you have to work through, but the app itself, it, based on your on your usage, it chooses the perfect fit for you when it comes to your therapy. So it's highly personalized, highly individualized. This is something else that patients uh, very, very much value within our product. Amazing. Thank you so much. All right. Um, round of virtual applause here for you guys. And um, yeah, immob immobility is next. Hi guys, uh, can you hear me? Does it work? Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes, that works. So very nice. So I'll start sharing my screen. <clears throat> okay. So can you see it? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so good evening, everyone from our side as well. So I'm Daniel from Immobility, and I'm super excited to share with you some of the stuff that we are working on right now. And today we are talking about a problem that thousands have, but millions or even billions of us are affected by it. And we are talking about mobility and especially the influx of new mobility services. Here on that slide, um, you can see two examples of how new mobility could look like in real life. And as you can see, some cities are managing it quite well and others are really struggling. But why is that? 
So what are some cities doing different than others and what is their secret sauce? That's the question we've asked us. And for that, we are actually going to LA. And to be a little bit more precise, uh, the Los Angeles Department of Transportation. And in 2018, the so-called LA DOT had to deal with the exact same problems that many other cities are facing right now. So the immense influx of micro-mobility services has pushed them into a real chaos. And <clears throat> it was everything but easy for them to get back the control over their streets. But how have they managed it? And the secret sauce we were talking about is called MDS. So the LA Department of Transportation came up with something called MDS, which stands for Mobility Data Specification. And you may ask yourself why I'm showing this. Um, how should a specific uh, specification of a US city apply to Germany or even to Europe? And well, the MDS is more than just a piece of paper. The MDS describes a standard for the communication and the collaboration between the operators and the cities. It lets the city actively control and monitor the operations of the vehicles. So for example, so policies and rules can be set and linked to geofences. And by that, for example, vehicles could be slowed down when they like uh, enter certain uh, geofences, or you can determine parking areas. And that this actually works shows the increasing adoption of MDS amongst cities, but also more important amongst uh, the mobility operators. And about 60 US cities are already using MDS, while it is still widely unknown outside of the United States, especially like in Europe and Germany, so there's uh, not much uh, knowledge about MDS. And that's something we want to change. So worldwide, there are thousands of cities. And here on that slide, you can see some statistics about their global distribution. And I also don't want to go too deep into that. But as you can see, there will be a huge market, since many of these cities will still go through this mobility transformation. And the smaller a city gets, the less resources it usually has and the higher the need for outside help. So an old wisdom says, if there's no competition, there's probably no market. And there are already some competitors out there and most of, most of them can be found in North America. But unlike us, most of them are explicitly focused on micromobility. And we are working on a solution that ensures the integration of public transportation services, as well as the integration of other infrastructure that the citizens, its citizens can benefit from. And we are already working on a pilot with a German city and to make sure that our solution is the best fit for the German market. And we are currently looking for a few more pilot cities to get as much market validation as possible before, before we want to raise our first financing towards the end of this year. And here, a quick look at the team that wants to make this happen, including two of our key advisors. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, I'm open for questions. We'll stop sharing the screen that you guys can see me again and answer them. Thanks, Daniel, for this introduction of yours. Um, yeah, we, we do have a first question here. Um, I'm probably not sure if you can share this. Maybe you want to elaborate on the city you're piloting in? Uh, it's a Bavarian city, and it is uh, like a decent size. So. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. that's, that's all I can say for now. Uh, but but um, maybe you, uh, you can elaborate on the process. Um, is that something, so, something um, 
you're you're further in or or how, where do you stand? Yeah, there? yeah. Actually, we are already further in. Um, so we are currently preparing. Uh, so in the pilot preparation work we are right now, and so we are planning on uh, starting with a pilot um, in Q3 uh, this year. So like setting it up actually, and um, we are looking for more pilot cities, as I said. And if there are some cities in the round today, I'm super happy and excited yeah. to talk with them about it later in the breakout session. <laughs> but <clears throat> would you um, would you consider your customer base only on the um, on the um, governmental side, or can you also go actually, on the private market? Actually, that's a good question. So our idea was um, that it's only the cities, but um, since we were in the process, um, there were city planning offices that got uh, so we got. Uh, in contact with and they were also like super excited about our idea because um, many of the features that we are using um, also apply to other uh, problems like to infrastructure so we are doing it for mobile infrastructure but actually we can do it um, like our platform actually would also work um, to manage and operate uh, like uh, immobile uh, infrastructure amazing Okay, well, okay, guys, thanks. And another round of applause here for Daniel. <laughs> no more further Thank questions. You. And he's also ha happy to see you later in the networking room. Um, yeah. yeah, perfect. Thanks, Daniel. So next up will be um, picture framing, if you could take over. Thank you very much. Um, give me a second. Do you see my screen? Perfect, yeah, that works. All right, thank you very much. So, hey, everyone, I'm, ne I'm Miele. I'm the founder of uh, Picture Framing, and we are here to disrupt video production within companies. To show you the problem we solve, uh, I took Sarah with me. Sarah is a marketing manager in a company with more than 12 employees. And Sarah needs videos every day in different sizes and this for different uh, channels. In her function as a marketing manager, she's, she's responsible to keep all the social media accounts of her company up to date and to stay, for example, with videos in contact with her community uh, daily. And she doesn't only need a lot of videos, but she needs it also in different sizes, for example, upright for Instagram stories or square for uh, Instagram feed. The problem is she has no time to produce all these videos and she has no budget to hand the task over to an agency. And now there is the COVID-19 effect, which means that her uh, budget is even uh, shrinking and um, the, yeah, the online uh, presence of her company is even more important now. So Sarah needs a solution for fast, simple, and cheap creation of branded business videos. And we call this solution Mosaic. Mosaic automates the entire video production process from video concept to cutting the video. And that's how it works. So first of all, Sarah has to choose a category where she wants to produce a video in. Afterwards, there are templates provided for several situations. She choose one of this uh, template and then she sees the storyline. Afterwards, she's guided step by step uh, through the process. The app gives her camera tutorials, gives her um, yeah, some hints what to say in the video. And at the end, she adds the design. So she adds the corporate identity color. She adds the logo of her company. And at the end, she gets two sizes of a professional business video ready for posting. The market um, is in Germany uh, for this solution 180 million, million euros. In the whole European Union, even more than 1 billion. And if we look a bit more uh, from above on the market, we can uh, see a substantial growth rate in the, the sector of creative software in Germany. In the last five years, the sector grew more than 43%. Competition in the market uh, is very small at the moment. There are startups working on a similar process we are working on, but at the moment they are a bit more like a modern video agency and 
not everything is automated and we are the first one automating everything. To give you one example, Storybox, for example, uh, needs 14 days to onboard a new customer. In our case, it's three minutes. You download the app, you make an account, you pay, and you can uh, produce your videos. To our team, um, David and I, we are the founders of Picture Framing. David as a CTO, I as a CT CEO, and uh, we have four developers, uh, Markus, Luca, Christian, Fabian, uh, two marketing and sales experts with Chris and Ramona. And we have one business angel working at the moment in our company and advising us without having shares um, in sales questions. Uh, Rainer Erlert is the former um, director of Europe of EMC, which is today Dell. Our status, uh, we are at the moment in a beta, um, in beta test. And now we come to the timeline. We want to launch in the next two weeks. Um, so everything will start on the 1st of June this year. We will build up our, our sales funnel with a partner program with online sales, with uh, direct sales. And to finance our third development, we want to close our seed funding in the next three to six months. And yeah, uh, finish then more or less the whole development of of all the additional functions that will come uh, in the next, uh, yeah, next time. Thank you very much. And now I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks, Nele. Thank you, Nele. Um, that was, that was also very interesting. Um, what about your, your current customers and traction? Maybe you want to also elaborate on that yeah. in the piloting phase. Yeah. Um, we have at the moment, uh, more than 80 companies from different sectors in whole Germany as development partners. So they provide us feedback. Uh, we are asking them questions weekly and they helped us to adapt the software perfectly to their needs. And they will all, uh, also be our first customers. So, um, yeah, we will launch next week and we will start with, um, uh, with, with, uh, immobilien makler, I'm forgetting the word. And uh, then we will uh, go further on with, with, with uh, our yeah our next sector. So we have a long list. Um, and yeah, we will That's go fine. step after after our launch. Great. And then there was a question also um, about the pricing. And um, can you maybe say something to that and the business model? So I think it's a ZAS model. Yeah, ben. I'm just looking forward to the first Zolo video, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the pricing is, it begins with uh, 59 euros per month and it goes up to 499 euros per month for the corporate version. And uh, we also have like a big system behind it with a web app with, uh, where you can um, manage your, your team and everything. So it's not only a video app, but it's also a production uh, software. So you can uh, work in teams together and share your videos and give advice and all this stuff. So uh, it's not just uh, in the corporate version, it's not just a video app. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, thanks, Nilev. Um, Thank you very much. <laughs> there are, again, the applause for you. And um, we'll, we'll have uh, Movako next up. Hi, together. Can you all hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. So I will start the presentation. All right. Can you all see it? Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, hello together. I'm Valentin, uh, the CEO of Movaku. We are super happy to be here and to be a, a part of the Zollhof. We are Movaku. We are reinventing carpooling for companies. What does this mean? Um, we saw a big problem, and uh, the problem is that many, many companies, especially in rural areas, generate unnecessary costs. Why? As you can all see, uh, many of the employee, employees are driving to car by uh, driving to work by car, and many of them alone in their cars. So um, those companies need many parking lots, and driving is not only bad for the environment; it also triggers stress for the employees and a lot of costs. So the reason um, at a 
<laughs> the solution is a carpooling tool, but um, there's another problem. And carpooling tools need a critical mass. So many companies don't have enough employees to uh, benefit from such carpooling tools. And therefore, we created the Movaco B2B carpooling platform. The platform automatically generates carpools. You have a very, very easy and quick registration, also possible via your company ID. And of course, we can um, have statistics for the companies for their um, social reportings. Um, and the app will be available for all different devices. In addition, we will um, have the ability to add some other services like shuttle services that are um, important for, for big companies, but also um, could be used for public transportation. So the innovative part of our product is that we have a progressive web app. That means it could be um, it can scale very high and very fast. We can add a lot of new customers in short time. Also, um, our route calculation and matching algorithms allows to generate call pools automatically. So our aim is to fully automate the whole process so that you as a user just uh, get to know if there's a carpool and don't have to do anything more. And we designed our app for the business use. So we have single sign-on interfaces. OK, let's take a look at the status quo. We have a pilot project ongoing with the Harbor Group that's near Coburg. And we plan to have further pilotings in this year. So what did we do with Harbor? First of all, we made a survey. Then we evaluated the working hours of all employees. So we had a database to work on our app. Then we made some requirement workshops with them. So we tested the app, we implemented new features. Um, and the third thing we did was that we made some coordination with the legal department. So we are ready, we made some contract draftings and had some data protection um, stuff. So the product status quo is all those features um, from the workshops we implemented already into the app. We have for example, now multi-language and um, our app is nearly available for Android and iOS. So let's take a look at what types of variations our product has. First of all, the, the basic platform, like the, the one we originally built, um, it's perfect for those companies that are big enough to have the critical mass and especially for those um, which are in rural areas where no other company is around. But we also can open our platform, so it's called Nationwide Platform, to combine many, many companies, especially those uh, small companies that don't have the critical mass, combine them that um, cities, for example, can use it, or um, even counties. So our USP, on the one hand, we designed our app as a business solution, so we have those interfaces, and on the other hand, we have a um, very high um, data protection level. So our user data is very safe and that's important for business applications. Let's take a look at our roadmap. We finished prototyping, we started our pilot project and we want to launch in the DAC market in the next year. And also we are exist funded right now and are looking for seed funding as soon as we have our first revenues. So this is the team, Franz, Tim, and Florian, and me. We are the founders of Mobaco. And we have some uh, two more team members, um, Marcy and Jakob, front-end developer, and one, and Jakob, he's doing a bachelor thesis. And we also started projects um, called Pendler Platform in Coburg and in Lichtenfels, where we work together with the city and um, the Stadtwerke. So that's all. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, I'm super excited to hear all your questions and I will turn off the presentation. Thank you, Valentin. Um, that's, that's great to have you with us. Um, I'm super thrilled to, to, um, to hear more about you later in the networking room. Maybe 
we can also elaborate a little bit about um, your current pilot with Harbor. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, um, how, how how is that going, and um, and and what are the plans there? Maybe also in in terms of Corona times, how are you dealing with that? I think yeah. that's also something people are interested in. What what uh, in, what's important? We we had a um, we we talked a lot to Harbor during the Corona times. And first, uh, in the first step, we thought um, that this might be the end, but <laughs> it isn't. So uh, they know that people will come back to work, they will drive back to work, and the potential is still very high. So the next steps are to really launch our app at, the, um, at, at Harbor for all the employees so they can use it to go step by step back to work and even to to gather new companies to to join this this whole uh, platform that means that people can um, go by carpools but with the restrictions of corona so they have for example fixed carpools and that will slow down the virus as well okay yeah, thanks. Thanks for that explanation. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm reading the questions here. So maybe also um, two last questions. Maybe you want to take yeah. that into the networking room. But um, is what what um, and how does it work with flexible working hours? I think is that an issue yeah. for you or no? Um, it's not an issue anymore. We 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 integrated it from the beginning on, so the the tool works perfectly for fixed hours, but also for flexible hours. You can use it as a fixed planner, but also to um, to use carpooling very flexible, like uh, thirty minutes before you want to leave, for example. And um, what USP would you um, outline for larger companies using your 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 solution? Um, like we saw the thing that um, big companies will have to manage their employees to give them the um, the login to the platform and with our with our single sign on interface we give those companies the possibility to manage it all on their own with uh, such little time that they don't really have to to bother okay yeah well um if there's more interest um then valentine is happy to see you later in the networking room and so far thanks valentine for for presenting you. your solution um so yeah next up would be horreich i'm happy to hear uh, about your pitch guys please take over the screen sure hello everyone we gonna share the stream in a uh, the screen in a second Um, there you go. Hope that works for you. Yeah, we can see you and uh, also the screen and hear you well. Perfect, thanks. Perfect. Yeah. All right, just a little introduction about the two of us. Um, my name is Andreas Reichle and I studied mechanical engineering at the FAU. And at our current company, the Horach UG, we're I'm responsible for embedded and web development as well as marketing. My name is Fabian Hoppe. I studied mechatronics engineering at the University of Erlangen. I worked as a development engineer in electronics and I'm responsible for finance, sales and hardware development at Horach. Right. Yeah, just a few words about our company, which was founded last year in August 2019 when we received the BMBE-sponsored EXIST scholarship. And um, currently we are located in Nuremberg at the Institute of Factory Automation and Production Systems. And our company is, um, is in the IoT market for construction and building industry. I wanna right jump into our problem we discovered a huge market for structural health monitoring at structures that are off-grid, remote, at remote locations, and distributed locally as well as globally. This infrastructure can be wind turbine towers, can be bridges, or can be any construction site, like which is inherently off-grid. 
and the fact is these infrastructure this infrastructure these structures must be monitored due to legal and also technical reasons and this is where our customer pain begins there are many different solutions many are insufficient and non-standard standardized for example to read out a sensor you need a special device which you plug in on site manually and read out the sensor data and there's also the future challenge of building information modeling, which is not currently our major focus, but will be uh, in future, I guess. And what does this mean specifically for our clients? In the left picture, you see a wind turbine tower. The first half of it is made out of half concrete shells. These uh, shells have gaps, which have to be monitored with uh, displacement sensors. You see in the small picture in the middle. For this displacement sensors, you need um, kilometers of wiring and uh, hardware, which uh, costs several, fent several fent thousand euros. And if this wouldn't be enough, all the data has to be collected manual by a um, worker. And with our universal sensor platform, all this can be done without wiring, automatically, reliable and cheap. But anyway, can do more. Right, I'm going to tell you about our solution for this industry I was talking about earlier. And this is our universal sensor platform, which features um, like where you can plug in any kind of industrial sensor. It is a small form factor device, which also features different wireless technologies to have the best coverage. And the entire platform is also features an uh, online platform. So there's an uh, online platform built around this platform to, to give the user the sensor data and also for documentation purposes and so on. So the major benefit for a customer is that the customer saves money. And I think this is important because as we saw earlier, um, currently most of the data is read out manually. So the worker has to drive to the to the site and read out the data with special devices which also saves time saves costs and personnel we have um, built a plug and play solution which you can just like apply at any site it is fully autonomous and automatically creates like documentation online when it sends data and we don't need any external wiring don't need any power external power and by integrating different wireless technology we achieve a very good coverage just uh, a few words about our market which is huge um, the civil engineering market um, has a revenue of around 115 billion euros a year and the productivity, however, has only grown by 1% every year over the last 20 years, which is, uh, which is not much. And it also has to do um, with the low digi degree of digitization in, in this market, which we want to change. And Fabian, going to tell you about our timeline a little bit. Yes, um, I want to tell some words about our timeline. timeline. We already entered the wind power market and we overcame several technical issues. And in the near future, we deploy our universal sensor platform in Poland and enter the infrastructure market with the result of recurring revenue. And besides, we are in the register progress for a patent in a specific sensor application and want to reach investor readiness in the next half year. Right. Thank you very much. And now uh, we are ready for your questions. Cool. Thank you guys um, for presenting your um, solution. And um, yeah, um, I was I would be wondering um, where where you would also see this field besides um, the um, wind wind park and and maybe um, construction side. Um. 
Yeah, another field is the monitoring of uh, of bridges, for example. Uh, besides the uh, uh, the wind power, we because uh, as there was a um, um, just um, uh, in Genoa. Oh, in Genoa, yeah, this um, collapse of the bridge in Genoa, for example, is a good example for a good use case for a uh, device. For another um, thing which has to be monitored mm -hmm. in the future, and yeah. And how, if you take that Genoa example, how do you think these bridges were monitored? I'm very sure that they weren't monitored. Um, right. Right. The, I can, right now, it's they they are um, they are um, there's manual monitoring. Uh, for example, after five years, uh, for example, in Poland, there's after five years, uh, some guy looks at the bridge and uh, makes some pictures and says, "Oh, everything is fine," or there are some problems. In Germany, it's more often. Um, I'm not very sure about the situation in, Ital in Italy, but uh, I think there is no continuous monitoring. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, well, and um, this might be an upside for you guys and in order to tackle and um, happy to have you here and, and welcome to the toll of a uh, new batch. Um, we'll probably now um, move the questions coming up for you guys into the networking room. Um, we'll have a short break and uh, we'll continue after with, um, with our fellow startups. So let's meet back here at 610 everybody and um, yeah thanks for the in-house startups for this presentation i think this was quite interesting um every everybody um, who joined later um there are networking rooms um, with each startup where you could also drop some questions and we're happy to to have you here and see you back at 610.
All right. Hope everyone could use the break. And um, thanks so much for the in-house startups. I think um, that was quite an interesting um, glance into our local junior um, upbringers. And then now we're super happy to kick off our fellow startups and um, with Moritz and Abram from, um, um, if, for, hold on guys, I gotta do that from Factual, that I pronounced it correct. All right, give it up for Factual, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Nils. Um, hi, my name is Moritz, I'm super excited to be here. Let me also figure out how to share it quick. And yeah, my uh, co-founder and friend Abraham is here as well. Uh, hi everyone. I guess you see a white screen now. That's correct. We can hear you. See white screen. Perfect. All right. I'm going to kick the whole thing off with a quick question in the beginning. So how is research currently done? And that is the question we asked ourselves and we asked that together, like while monitoring about 25 to 30 journalists and people working in PR. And I guess we all uh, know the situation. We go online, we type in some search words, we get the right information relevant facts we can then save and pretty much go on with whatever we're doing, right? Or it is a bit more like that. We go online, we are overwhelmed by the amount of search results or the, the hits, 4 billion. We get not really insights, but we get links to sources. Uh, we go through Google with several ser uh, searches or end up on page four. And what the journalist told us, for example, people from Spiegel said they end up with about 120 open tabs. And what they do is they go to every single tab, read through the entire thing just to find that one tiny fact or paragraph that actually adds value to their research. And all that leads to a bigger problem. First of all, it's not only cumbersome and super annoying um, to read stuff that doesn't really add value. It also leads to a lagging depth in the research and reduced efficiency. And all that leads to burning money, which uh, media companies currently just can't afford due to reducing uh, revenues. And yeah, that's the problem we from Factual um, tackled or are tackling at the moment. And as I said, excited for the six, next six months at Solhof. So how do, we, how do we tackle this problem or what is our current solution? We do that in pretty much three steps. First of all, we collect the information the journalists need. And that happens by them suggesting sources that we then add to a search engine. And uh, we collect all those information continuously and therefore they can select which sources they wanna use. And they can heavily rely on the primary sources and also on regional sources that might not be relevant enough uh, to be shown on Google. We then have in the search engine an NLP, natural language processing algorithm, which based on the search words of the user all automatically extracts the most important facts, figures, uh, quotes, and other information. The user can then take those insights and basically gather those facts. And for the journalist or the PR people, they can then build the structure of their next uh, article or a press release and can go on with uh, the, what they actually love most, the investigative research, basically go out to the people and find things that are not um, shown online. I also brought a little product demo, so that is how the tool currently looks. So it's a bit uh, more visual. Um, yeah, we have it more or less built like a common search engine, so it's easy to use. We there see the selected sources and already the extracted information so, for example, facts about uh, refugees during Corona times. Um, we then can easily collect those, this content um, and build our research structure. Um, well, in that case, it, it seems to be a good topic. So we create a, yeah, let's say, research report. Um, we also allow to process the information within the web app right away. So um, you don't need to open several tabs. You can work on it in the same second. And then after closing it, you have all the facts. We also allow the user to manage the findings. And lastly, what I've talked about, uh, requesting sources and selecting or deselecting sources according to what uh, kind of domain I as a researcher work in or also what kind of interests I have. 
And that was a little tour through our um, yeah, product currently. Um, what we found out is that by using Factual, we can increase efficiency, also the quality, because it's uh, yeah, we, we go more into depth since uh, facts are extracted right away. And also the traceability adds a lot to it, since now we can always trace back where the information came from. After doing some tests, that leads to 15 hours um, savings per month per journalist. And that directly is also reflected in the money through, for example, subscriptions um, and time saving. And now uh, guiding over to the next steps, I now show the two markets. So first of all, the total addressable market for journalists. It might not be the biggest market, but it's, I think, a really good niche to start since that is where research has the biggest impact. On the other hand, we see the total addressable market for those kind of research tools in the area of knowledge management, which means, for example, making knowledge within a company easy, findable, and also usable. And I think many of us know the problem within a company that the internal search engines also not the best. And uh, that is kind of the issue we also want to tackle on the long run. So as I said, currently we're operating in the field of uh, journalism and media. We have uh, currently tests running with uh, Tagesschau, DPA, News Actuell, and several other companies. Um, but by the end of the year, we want to focus or head a little more towards knowledge management. So not just making external information accessible, but also the internal information of media companies, but also of companies in the industry. And there, um, we already saw the great network of Zollhof, and we would be really happy to maybe come up with a project with some of the partners. Lastly, why um, are we different than other search engines? Uh, I think natural language processing and also AI in general, with, for example, recommender models, is, yeah, kind of a, a topic that just emerged the last within the last two years in a way that you can actually use it to make products better. Um, so there's new uh, scientific approaches to it pretty much every second month. And I think we're really hopping onto that wave. Also, we got the internet inside. So it's not just like analyzing internal data potentially, but also having uh, external information to build up really a knowledge base. And lastly, um, we can also provide knowledge uh, management analytics, pretty much tracking what the people are searching for to then either back backplay to other journalists to show trending topics, but also, for example, to show um, in a company, hey, that is a field where a lot of people search for, but you don't have like a really good document, for example, explaining the topic. Lastly, to our team, so um, Abraham and me, we co-founded, or we founded the Factual in the end of February this year, so we are still quite young. We already have uh, two people helping us in the development, uh, Marcelo and Vitor. And yeah, we are really excited to kick off with Solhof and also excited to answer your questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Moritz, um, um, for this presentation. Um, quite interesting um, to hear about your story. What I was wondering probably is um, how the two of you have met and maybe also tell us about more about your story together. Yeah. Um, so we both met, so next to our normal master's degree at the University of Munich, we did uh, another like kind of add-on study program um, in the field of entrepreneurship. And there we met like, I don't know, about one and a half years ago working in the field, like helping uh, a company in the area of farming out with some new like, business models so it's not the first project we're working on together but yeah it was a it was a funny start okay that's that's amazing and um, maybe a question from the uh, from ben um about your business model if you want to elaborate on that mm -hmm. so um in the field of journalism it's pretty like a pretty simple SaaS model so we start with like up to 15 licenses it's about 20 euro per user and then after that um up to 50 licenses, it's uh, 15 euro. And then after that, we have the enterprise solution, which also includes, uh, for example, an integration into their CMS system. Um, and then with regards to corporates, I got to say that this is kind of the next step. We have not 
totally looked into it. I think it's also a big question um, about the existing IT structure of the company, since integrating such a solution into, for example, intranet needs a lot of like connectors to different databases. And therefore, I think it will be highly dependent on the existing IT infrastructure. Cool. Well, um, thanks. Thanks, Morris, for elaborating more on that. Um, please uh, feel free to take your questions to the network room with um, Factual. And um, I would like to now um, welcome CDDoc. And um, yeah, I'm happy to hear about CDDoc now. There we are. I can see you already. Hi, everybody. I'm Dilan. I'm the founder of CDDoc. And this is Muras. Hi everyone, I'm Murat. I'm uh, advising ZDoc in terms of finance, business model and strategy. And uh, we are really happy to be part of um, this year's batch at Solhof and sharing some information about our startup. I'm sharing my screen right now. Perfect, we can see that, thanks. Perfect. So, do you know how many doctors in Germany are not working permanently as a doctor? More than 120,000 or 25% are not working permanently as a doctor. During my work as a medical doctor, I have found that patient care cannot always be ensured. Delivery rooms are closed. Emergency rooms are overcrowded and specialist practices have long waiting times. You might think now that there are not enough doctors in Germany. In fact, is, um, in fact Germany is among those countries with the highest density of doctors worldwide. The reason for the problem is the existing structure in healthcare system. This is exactly where ZDoc steps in. We use our technology in a meaningful way and establish new work in healthcare and enable doctors to work independently and flexible. At the same time, this helps medical facilities making sure treatments are not postponed or even canceled. This ultimately helps increasing their case numbers and economics. We do this by offering an KI-driven marketplace matching doctors and medical facilities. Let's uh, have a quick look at the market. We have um, around about 2000 hospitals and clinics. 90% have a demand for um, external stuff. Around 40% are already calling in external stuff. In addition, we have 50,000 nursing homes and 150,000 practices. We see there is already business going on. So let's have a look onto the competitors. We have around 2000 HR agencies in Germany serving the healthcare sector. Um, thereof, 6.5% are pure play healthcare agencies. All agencies together generate a revenue of 1.5 billion euro. There is no industry leader and the market is fragmented. We see a significant upside if the business is done with state-of-the-art technology, which brings us to the USP of ZDDoc. We are a health tech startup utilizing technology for customers' benefit. We conducted thorough competitor analysis and analyzed their operating model. This, is, um, this on the left side um, shows how it looks like today. We have digitized the entire process end to end. In addition to this, ZDoc is working on additional products and function uh, offering holistic solutions to increase productivity in the healthcare system and helps doctors throughout their entire career. This is us and yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much um, for, for this presentation. Maybe as long as we wait for the questions from the from the crowd, I would probably like to know the feedback of your current um, customers and pilot customers. Maybe you want to elaborate on that. Um, well, um, 
the, the, the initial customers we had were um, working was quite hands on. So we had uh, two customers really going through the um, at the beginning of, of the project through the um, through the product itself. So navigating through uh, with the help of our developers. And so we had a lot of customization before we uh, went online and put it into commercial operation. And uh, what we receive as uh, feedback from uh, from the customers, which are really can be very different. If you have a big organization using the tool, you have uh, people in the HR arena using it. If you have a, a small facility, it could be the doctor himself putting the request online and um, the request is really positive. Uh, it is like everyone waiting for it to, 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 to have this specific process in the healthcare industry to be digitized. So yeah, quite, quite positive and we are looking forward to make further customizations and really um, do what the customers need. Great. Thank you so much. Um, maybe there is also, um, yeah, there was another question on the traction um, regards the hospitals. Maybe you want to also take that into the networking room if you, or if you want to elaborate now. Yeah, let's take that into the networking room. And um, Marcus, you can see them at 7 p.m. And there is an invitation link to, uh, attached to your invitation. Um, thank you, City Doc. Welcome. Happy to have you. And uh, we would move on now uh, to Vertonomy. And um, yeah, thanks, Zidido. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. See bye. you later. See you later. Okay, and this is Scott McLaughlin. Uh, first off, thank you very much to the Tilhof team and their supporters for allowing us to be here today. Sure. So we can see your screen now, Scott. Thanks. Excellent. So good evening, everyone. My name is Scott McLaughlin, and I'm the COO and CFO of Vertonomy. We are a Munich-based medtech startup that is focused on making clinical trials of medical devices faster and more affordable using our virtual patients. Medical device makers are required to test their new products before releasing them to the public. So let's say you've developed a new and improved heart valve, for instance. You have to start with testing that in bench testing, followed by testing the device in various animals, and then ultimately in human trials. But the cost of this process for high-risk devices like your heart valve have risen 450% over the last 10 years, while the time to market can take as long as a decade. This is clearly a problem for launching new life-changing and life-saving medical devices. And at Rotonomy, we believe our virtual patients offer a new form of testing that can cut this time and cost in half without compromising patient safety. As you can see here, virtual patients and simulation currently take up only a small segment of the clinical trial testing market. But according to the American Food and Drug Administration, virtual patients and simulation are expected to grow 40 to 40% of the total market in the next five years. As a result, the global virtual trial market could reach up to 30 billion US dollars in 2025. So let's jump right into a real example of how our virtual patients have recently helped one of our customers. RealHeart is a Swedish company that is developing a total artificial heart for patients with severe congestive heart failure. In 2018, they conducted a series of failed animal trials as their early prototype design was mismatched with the animal selected. Here you can see a picture of the device bulging out of the chest of a calf. The device simply didn't fit and a lot of time and money was spent in discovering this and how to fix it. Using CT and MRI scans of various animals and breeds, we helped RealHeart define a new implementation protocol and test different configurations of their device, all virtually from the convenience of their computer screen, so that they could then perform a successful transplant in a live animal, as seen here on the right. Following this, we continued to work with RealHeart in testing their design and fit in virtual human patients as well, which allowed them to better understand the differences in anatomy among genders, ethnicities, and body sizes, which in turn, help them to make design changes that allow them to broaden their potential market size. 
Our work with Wheelheart and other customers was the precursor to our currently under development cloud-based SaaS solution, a preview of which I've included here for you. So instead of working with each customer directly on a per device basis, our solution automates the thousands of CT and MRI data sets we've collected to date and allows the medical device makers to conduct their testing, including anatomy study, fitting, and population analysis online using our virtual patients. As I've mentioned, medical device makers are our customers, along with clinical organizations and testing facilities who will pay a license fee to access our software and our data. The hospitals are not our customers, but are our partners who we will incentivize to provide us with the patient data sets that drive our systems. Vertonomy can assist our customers in all five stages of the testing market. And many of our current customers have worked with us in more than one phase. We believe our virtual patients can reduce trial and error, time loop reiterations, and unnecessary animal deaths, saving substantial time and money. Here are our two co-founders, along with myself, who started Vertonomy last year. Since that time, we have hired a growing team of software developers and have a strong advisory board, along with a network of over 10 hospitals to date from across the globe that are supplying the data sets. We closed our pre-seed round last month and are currently working on our seed round that will allow us to finalize the development of the web solution, other important milestones, and fulfill our mission of becoming not only the market pioneer, but also the market leader in digitizing medical device testing using virtual patients. We are Vertonomy, and we can be reached at funding at vertonomy.io. Thanks, Scott, for the presentation. And um, <clears throat> yeah, quite an interesting journey you have there. Um, maybe um, you can also elaborate on 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 the aspects why you guys founded this company and what probably made you move as far as i know sure so our, our two founders who founded the company last year uh simon and wen young both of their backgrounds are in either medical devices particularly cardiac medical devices or in uh, medical digital imaging so very strong connection to this industry and very familiar with this market the, uh, the, the trend is, is very much going towards simulations, given the fact that traditional methods are just too time consuming and too expensive. Absolutely. Yeah, happy to have you guys. Thanks for that presentation. Um, Thank you very much. We, we would now move on with the next startup here in our um, fellowship, and that would be Neo Helden. Happy to take you over, guys. Perfect. Give me a second to share the screen, and then we're ready to go. Cool, Philip, thanks. Yeah, we can hear you and we can see your screen as well. Perfect. Oh, shit. So the screen, sorry about the screen thing. Try again. So there we go. I hope it works. If not, please interrupt me at any time. It does. Okay. So thanks very much for having us. Um, my name is Philip. I'm co-founder of Neoheld and together in this call with Kiria, who's also a co-founder. And we develop a digital AI assistant for business called Neo that allows you to control processes and create documentations with natural language. So we are a startup located in Karlsruhe, Germany. We are currently 11 employees started the company back in 2018 and are really proud to call companies like Daimler, Siemens, and Dekra our customers. And our customers use Neo in various application fields and mainly to get rid of internal processes which are messy. Um, so you've got all sorts of documentations, instructions, forms that people have to fill in that distract you from your job that you're trying to do and achieve. Also, you've got to work with multiple systems and tools at the same time. And this is kind of hard for an employee to juggle and to do all whilst doing the actual job. And that's where we come into play. And that's where Neo comes into play. And you can see Neo here at the center of the screen. And essentially, Neo allows you as a user to both text and talk to Neo. Neo tries to understand what you're saying and then text and talks back to you. 
And we do that by connecting you to systems and processes in the backend in order to simplify these for you. And so that means we can both get information from systems, but also can put information back into the systems where it belongs. For the user then, Neo is simply an app that he can install on the devices he's currently using at work, being on iOS, uh, Android, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, or can call, can, can give Neo a call, use it via WhatsApp and other channels, because at the end, it's attracted to a simple conversation. For our customers, really important in Germany is being able to host the system on premises, meaning on your own infrastructure. And an aspect that's really important, number five here, is that you can develop, customize, and tweak Neo by yourself because Neo is not just an app, but rather the Neo Enterprise Assistant Platform, the conversational AI tool that allows you to tweak, customize, and train Neo so that he understands your language and processes. And our customers use mainly Neo for two use cases, in documentation and in guided working. And this looks, for example, for Siemens in the case, we guide users through the inspection of power plants where they can record whatever just happened and what they see and what damages occurred, take pictures, and instead of having it handwritten on paper and assigning in the, the back and then the Word document images to the respective inspection points, Neo does that for them because they document via voice, they take the pictures and are being guided through the use case. Similarly, what we do with Hermes, for example, where Neo walks you as a delivery driver who's got to deliver between 120 and 300 parcels per day through your job. And because we use voice, we can be in the car and usually people try to navigate in the car, use their app whilst they are driving. This isn't necessarily the best idea if you consider safe practices in driving. And Neo allows them to do all of that via voice. There's obviously plenty of other use cases that I'll skip for the sake of this call and focus on the market. And currently, we focus on customers in DAG only. Um, we've got an idea of customer profile. We focus on SMEs who have got processes that are data intense with the multiple data entry points and a lot of legacy systems in place that are usually not the most user friendly ones. And our solution really helps them to make them more accessible, but also is able to integrate with them because part of our platform is an integrational framework. And so this leaves us with a market size, essentially, if you want to cut it, up, cut it up like that in the initial year with about uh, a million uh, or so. And then it expands and increases depending on the focus area and the market area we focus on. Um, in terms of our roadmap, we are currently live with our system and use it in production at various customers. Um, use cases we are looking more into is tackling edge device and offline use cases because that's a requirement we oftentimes face. So you can imagine in power plants, you don't have the best internet connection as well as in Germany sometimes. And in terms of sales, we focus very much on systemizing our approach towards customers and channels in order to acquire more customers who have similar problems. Um, in operations, we then focus on the onboarding process of our customers in order to allow them to quickly build assistance by themselves. And that's a quick summary of a lot of work that we put into our product in the last couple of years. And happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Philip, for that presentation. Um, also quite interesting and congratulations on your journey so far. Um, I would I would also probably like to go on the on the personal level here of of the two of you and and maybe where you come from and why you you you, you founded this company. Kirill, okay, do you want to start? Yeah, of course. Um, I I start with the second question. Why did we found this startup or this idea? It was funny. We um we met us uh, four and a half years ago. With uh, with our other startups, uh, pre startups before in a in a startup uh, event, and um, the the mindset of all three founders was uh, in the same direction. So we we met us, we found us, we loved we love us. So we started uh, the the idea to to say what what competence do we have and what is in the B2C market uh, up to date? And that's digital assistance like Siri and Alexa. And we adapted it to a business aspect, to the enterprise aspect. That is the reason why we found this company. 
and this is startup. While we are at Solhof, um, um, you and uh, the, the speaker before mentioned it already. Solhof is a really fast growing uh, accelerator uh, and um, we have a big network, uh, really interested companies inside partners and uh, Philip um, showed you that we, we can use our conversational AI platform in industrial area, but uh, also in the insurance area. That, that means we can ramp up really fast and digital assistant for different business um, areas and bus different companies. And um, it's not only a chatbot for a website, you can give it to, to employees. They, can, they get their own assistant. That's the vision of us. That's a great one, Kiryu. Thank you so much for elaborating. Um, yeah, and um, all the questions for, for you guys also um, in the networking area later on. Um, thank you for, for, for being here. I'm super happy um, to work with you guys in the next half a year. Um, okay. Next up, there would be <coughs> uh, Vaya. I'm super happy to, to hear about you guys. There you are. Perfect. Let's see you. Hi there. Can you hear me? I can hear you as well. Hi, how are you? Let me share oh, my hi. screen with you. Sure. Great. Can you see my screen? It's coming up. Thanks, Rotem. Perfect. OK. Uh, so first of all, nice to meet you. My name is Rotem Geslevich, and I'm the director of business development for the European market. Uh, before I jump in and introduce the company, uh, introduce us, I want to um, tell a few words about the company because it's not the typical startup that I saw so far. So the company was actually founded nine years ago by three Israeli innovators. We raised up till today close to $190 uh, million and we have 170 employees in the company. We actually develop radar imaging sensors that are quite unique, and we created different products for different uh, industries. Today, we have thir over 30 patents and two, um, two B2C products, and I'm actually in charge of what I'm about to show you that is very unique sensors for senior care. So. These amazing three founders uh, founded the company nine years ago, um, and each, each one of them have over 30 years of experience. They combine really a unique um, background from mobile wireless networks in, in Wi-Fi and uh, radio frequency waves and software. And with uh, their experience, they had in mind to actually create something that we're not gonna focus about, but it's a really interesting story why they started it actually a device that was supposed to uh, kind of replace breast cancer screening. So uh, the idea was to actually take the same radar imaging sensor that can see through walls and objects and create a 3D image of the breast and the tumor, uh, a device that can actually be uh, mobile, 100 times cheaper than mammography and, and painless and, and even mostly safe. So on the right side, you can see uh, an image that was taken uh, by our sensors and on the left, the mammography. But they realized that they can use uh, the same radar imaging sensor that can detect and create a 3D image in different use cases. And using the three amazing capabilities that we had, we have, we created a device for seniors. So the three um, capabilities I think that are can give us a lot of value in that specific um, audience. Uh, one is that our, the sensors are robust, meaning that if you think of any camera, um, they can work in any lighting condition. So even if the room is dark or, ste or there's steam or, or humidity, we can still um, create a 3D image and understand what's going on in, a, in, an, in the arena. Second, it's private. So we're not using any cameras. We're tracking the behavior of seniors, but we're not invading their privacy. That means that if you put the sensors in a private room, such as bathroom or bedroom, we're not really see, we don't really see the identity of the person and what he's doing. We see the movement and, and mainly the falls that we want to detect. 
And three, we have what we, what we call Superman vision. So we can actually see through, through walls and objects. And that means that if we want to monitor an arena of uh, a senior, uh, even if the senior is behind um, a sofa or a bed or he fell behind a chair, we can actually detect that. So we looked at the market and um, we saw different fall detection and telecare solutions. You probably know some of them uh, at the bottom of the picture. You see the pendant, pendants and the wearables and the panic buttons that we all know. Maybe your grandparents, you saw them wearing them if they agreed to wear them. And we saw different limitations uh, for the product that exists in the market. Um, one, that they're wearable, which means that you have to remember to wear them in order for you to actually detect the fall. Second, they're button operated, so you actually need to press them to call for help. Um, there's a stigma for people that they feel like they look old once they wear them, so some of them don't even wear them, and you need to charge them every night. And the accuracy is, is not really like 100%, so there are a lot of false positives. And 80% of the owners don't even wear them during the fall. And in general, we, we felt like the market is hungry for something new that we can actually bring with our radar imaging sensor. So we created what we call the Wild at Home under Viar's brand, um, which is a hands-free emergency response system. So on the left, you see the product on the wall. So you basically just need to mount it on the wall, connect it to the power and the Wi-Fi, and then you have to do two steps. One, the device will kind of guide you to walk around the room and build the layout, the dimensions of the arena of your room. Um, second, uh, you'll have to program up to four emergency numbers. So it can be, you know, any monitoring center, or it can be your emergency or caregiver number, or it can be, for example, in Germany, the German Red Cross or Johannita, or any number that can actually provide you with help. Um, on the right, you can see how our sensors actually detect the person. So we're GDP, uh, GDPR compliant, and we have a CE, um, and you can actually see that we're not really, we, we don't really see the person. We just know how he's standing, his posture, his position, where he's located. And we started selling this actually in the US a year and a half ago, and this is why I'm here. And the product is relatively new. And um, I'm actually, I started working with the European market six months ago. And Germany is now on one of our focused countries that we want to expand to. Uh, and we realized that this is a really nice B2C product. And we started selling it to distributors all over the world and also now in Europe. But we thought that there's a really nice use case for even more than B2C. And uh, we expanded our offering to um, a facility, senior care facilities, nursing homes, assisted living, retirement housing, even hospitals. So today we work with different channels. And as you can see in, the, in my screen, um, we created this dashboard that is very visual. So you can actually see not only the falls that happened uh, in each room, and in case of a fall, you know, it will call the emergency numbers and send text messages, but you can also see where the, per the person is. So if we have 50 devices stored in a 50 apartments uh, senior care facility, you can actually see the status in each room. So we can define the area of the bed, and we know where the bathroom is and, or the toilet, and we can get alerts if a patient our resident left his apartment, left his room, if he left his bed and he has high risk of falling. So we can kind of understand more about residents and patients. Um, I'm, I wanna show you two slides about our future features uh, that we're currently working with. Um, one is that we're collecting history per resident dashboard. That means that if we install up to three devices in an apartment, so it's pretty much covered, um, I can track the, um, the behavior of a person. So the number of time that he goes to the bathroom, um, how long he's spent in bed, and then I can build like um, his regular behavior, his average behavior, and alert whenever there's a change in his behavior that can might cause for any health deterioration. And, and with that, we're kind of targeting a lot of insurance companies that do want to know one, whenever their insured fell and they need to provide help. But second, they want to get more data about, the, about their insured. That means that um, they want to know if a person is going more to the, to, to the bathroom at night and sleep less or, um, or maybe walking around, what you see uh, here at the nocturnal roaming. So these are data that no one knows except for the, per for the person that lives by himself. So it's really valuable information for insurance companies as well. And last slide about the 
future fall management, we're kind of collecting all the data about the falls to kind of understand at what time uh, each fall happened, uh, the date, the room. So we can kind of build like an uh, analytics tool for facilities um, in addition to insurance companies and also track the uh, average response time, even if it's for facility or insurance or for uh, B2C. Um, Thanks for watching. Uh, one last thing, um, we're looking for partners um, for different you know, channels in, in Germany, and this is why I'm here. I wanna expand and kind of learn more about the German market. And so insurance companies, senior care facilities, we work with hospitals, and I'll be happy to learn and get any contacts. Thank you, and thanks for accepting us to the program. Amazing, Rotten. thank you so much for presenting your approach. <clears throat> of um of your solution and um yeah i'm i'm super happy to um also promote your networking room for further questions in regards of um which industry fields you might be catering um probably we're gonna um take um on a question where you probably want to elaborate on the private market is that something you're considering so we are working with uh, we don't sell B2C, we work B2B. That means that we work with distributors that would sell directly to consumers. Uh, we do sell the product to distributors between a range of 150 euros to 200. Um, so I guess the consumer price would be around 300 to 350. For, okay, perfect, thank you. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm so happy also to, to uh, have you guys on our incubation program and i um, happy to, to guide you through uh, a successful German market entry, guys. Um, yeah, now for, um, for the update, um, we also have um, an interesting speaker coming up, in, I would say at 7.5. Um, and um, until then, and also for the startups and, and those who have questions, I would say um, this is um, the opportunity to meet um, in the in the hangout, in the individual hangout. We posted the links in the chat. Um, also, Ben also wants to say a few words here, and um, I want to really thank you guys for being a part of Tolov, and I'm happy to have you. Welcome to our incubation program all together. Yeah. So thanks again for all the pictures was super, super interesting. I hope you will also, the visitors enjoyed uh, the pictures, got some uh, infos and insights. Um, and as Nia said, yeah, um, we're now hearing a really in interesting speaker. Uh, and then it's time for networking. So feel free um, to ask all the questions in the private chat then. So uh, yeah, meet you in 10 minutes here. Thank you so much. Yeah. And See you in 10. happy to Bye.
Hi Andreas, well, um, thanks for joining. Um, you're still muted and we'll wait a couple more minutes. Um, one or two, we're fixing the current um, networking room um, scenario so that everyone can uh, enter, which is happening meanwhile as you joined. And um, so let's wait one more minute and, and hear you back at and in one minute. So, slowly, um, uh, welcome back, everybody, from this short break. Um, there was quite some interesting pitches we've seen so far, and um, um, I would now move on to um, Andreas Lem Dr. Andreas Lemke and our uh, short fireside chat on a virtual basis here during Corona times, and um, so so glad that you could find the time here to join us for a few questions. Um, maybe Andreas, you, you also want to elaborate a little bit about yourself and, and, and MIDI Air. What is it? What are you doing? And, um, and we would love to, to have um, um, a little bit exchange about your top learnings and, and your outlook in terms of your company and how it is to, to launch a digital solution in Germany in the um, med, med, medicinal space. Um, quite eager to hear your insight here and maybe uh, yeah welcome Andreas here and hope, hope to um, to have everyone's attention here now um, Andreas were you still muted what? ah yeah I got it can you hear me yeah we can hear all, you now. all right so thank you for this nice introduction thank you for being here and um, if you would like I, I prepared just a little some slides or I can just do it by talk as you and as you would like yeah, if you could share your screen, that's easier for sure, everyone. Sure, sure. Just to follow, to get to know. So thanks a lot. I hope you can see my screen. Um, I'm Andreas. I'm the founder and CEO of Medier. Um, and I will just briefly introduce Medier to you and then directly jump into your questions and what we are. So a little bit of history about us. Um, so first, um, I founded another company called HQ Imaging in 2015 in the radiology business or MRI radiology business. Um, and from that, um, we, yeah, I was introduced by some customers to the idea of, uh, let's say, AI and radiology, computer vision, if I have a product. And at that time, during HQ Imaging, I developed a prototype. And then uh, I found out that they are willing to pay for that. So I said, OK, I have to do it in a bigger way uh, not with uh, bootstrapping, but with really a lot of funding. And that's why, and with a different team. And that's why I founded Medier 2018. But of course, I had some preparation time because this is really tough. As you can see now, our time plan and don't think that it's uh, you have to do it as quick as in these, let's say, ranges. And uh, so we did uh, the founding in 2018 and then um, one year later, we had already the um, certification as a medical product for MD Brain and as a company for medical product delivery. Um, and in the same time, one month later, so this was 
let's say in in, in a shared way um, we convinced also um, our uh, the high tech gründer for and our other um, private investors to give us a seed funding and to continue with the um, development and i will later show you some details about the funding and then some months later we uh, let's say here we diagnose quite some patients um, with our software but that doesn't mean that we get a lot of got a lot of revenue so far and then we saw that um, our first product md brain 1.1 we had to do a big next release to really let's say foster the um, and and enable the um, uh, usability for the customers that they are willing to pay um, in every month so this is where we are right now and now in in may we are looking for our series a financing round and launched already the md brain version 2.2 so some words about the team uh, that's me i'm usually i um, uh, am a physicist i um, did my phd in heidelberg and then in mri physics but then went to Bosch to do something completely different, developed electric cars and uh, had some predictive maintenance to do with um, and to step into machine learning. And like I said, 2015, I founded my first um, uh, startup and together with Jörg, who is my CTO, who is also a um, MRI physicist and was later at Flixbus, um, the AI engineer. So that's what I usually say to my investors that we have quite some capabilities in um, the, the, let's say, the background of MRI physics, but also in the industry, how to do software development. And then we convinced our uh, customers, and this is very essential, they are both radiologists and have their radiologic practice to found with us. So meaning you can do the product development directly with your uh, customers. This is the rest of our team. So right now we are 17 people, um, mostly in Berlin based, but we also have one office in Heidelberg. Um, and let's say talk just one or two seconds about the business case here and what is the problem. So radiologists right now, they see a lot of data, much more than they had to in the past. They have more exams, but the number of radiologists is, is the same. So right now they have just three seconds to look on an MRI image to make a diagnosis. And that's why um, it is one solution is deep learning, which had a lot of showed a lot of potential in the computer vision era. Um, and there were some, let's say, uh, statements from uh, scientific research centers, but also from Google that they are better than radiologists. But in the end, no radiologists in Germany using any AI so far, if you ask them. And why is that? Um, the problem is that when you introduce deep learning, you have to know that deep learning is very data hungry and it works perfectly fine when something is similar to your training data set. But if you have not a lot of training data, so you have very scarce expert label data sets like in medicine, um, it is very, very difficult when you go outside in a radiologic practice and the images differ from your training data set, then your algorithm really like fails. And that's why it's not possible. It was not possible that easy to introduce uh, deep learning in the medical market. Also, you have difficulties like the uh, workflow integration for the radiologists and you have topics like data security, uh, patient data security and regulatory requirements because it's a medical product. So meaning that's quite some tough job and quite difficult, but what is our product doing? So we take just MRI images as input and then this is the core here of the deep learning. We segment images. Yeah, segmentation means either if it's a lesion or a tumor, or like in this case, it's brain regions. And as more segmentations you, these deep learning needs, as longer it takes you to create such a labeled image for radiologists to learn something. Because, for example, to do such a segmentation, it takes him for 12 hours and such a data set costs 5,000 euro. And then we, when we have the segmentations, we put some evaluations with some normal cases like healthy one on top and then we do a comparison like when you go to a uh, with your blood measurement and you get a, a report and that's the same we 
then give the report automatically to the radiologists. So that's our product. Um, and now I want to introduce you to a bit to regarding financing, because one of the main issues for every startup is to start and think about how is your finance plan. And this is really essential. And here I want to show you how I considered financing. So right uh, after uh, founding, I already talked with the profit program and coaching bonus and so on. So I tried to apply for um, some some grants like here profit free phase. And in order to get to do that and to have this money, even if I don't pay me any salary, I needed some pre seed, let's say, uh, money from my um, from my founding team, like the radiologists or some business angel, which we had on board. So taking this money just to, to do a little, let's say, little things in the beginning. And then we got some grant from the Berlin Profit uh, but there are other grants in Germany available. So we had 270,000 um, as, a, as a grant and uh, or a loan. And then in February 2019, we got 1 million with the Hightech Gründerfonds to get our um, seed funding. So what you do there, definitely you, you have you need already some business plan, you need some minimal viable product. And ideally at that time, we had already a certified medical product. And then you got, uh, we got further, um, let's say, grants and uh, federal um, um, grants and federal projects and also did a lot of let's say competitions where we got some some more money and as you can see there we also gathered around 500,000 euro loan and, and and grants which is a help because you always need money um, and right now um, I'm looking for a 4 million series a round and as you can probably know, uh, due to Corona, it was not as easy to get this f 4 million right now. And I'm still struggling with it. And we can talk later about evaluation issues during Corona. So I'm sorry that this is in Germany, uh, but definitely you can ask me about that. Um, and just to, to come up with some conclusions about top learning. So for me if you think about what's the main three points to be in a let's say digital health or medical product area with some digital elements it's for me it's three points so you need something about certification yeah you have to gather that knowledge you have to start with some partners or consulting that really gives you some insights if you're not from this area it is super tough to introduce a quality management system, to know all that, how to do software development in this, let's say, typical risk-based approach. And really getting used to it from the beginning, what you need. That means you have a QM system, but you need the right, let's say, balance. You, you, you have to know what's inside the QM system, but you cannot tackle everything at the same time. In the beginning, you just need a little product to show to customers that's more important um but but you need the requirements of the qm system you don't have to do all this documentation with which takes you forever but you have to know what what comes let's say as a as a next step and to start only with the documentation if you have the right product market fit at some point so this is like the balance when to start when to plan plan early but don't start or don't waste too much time with documentation in the beginning and then take care about financing it's the most important part get as much money as you can from everywhere angels grants competitions vcs um, try to together competitions to get in contact with vcs at least talking with them even if 80 percent of them are not willing to invest in you you are already, you have their mail, you can introduce your things, you can pitch them and so on. Um, and then um, the last one is try to gather infos about which one is a suitable VC for you. There are VCs just for the pre-seed phase, for the seed phase, for the series A and the series B. Don't waste too much time to go to the VCs which just go for series A or higher. It, it will be a waste of time. And there are tables available and I can also share with you. That's not a problem. And then the last but not least, 
product market fit and sales. Don't think that in the beginning you need 100,000 MRR. If that's possible, great. But what you need is at least some customers who are willing to test your product and tell that the, your product is great. And then to try as early as possible if they are willing to pay for that product. And if not, develop your product, improve it, and so on. And don't waste too much time to gather more sales and more marketing in the medical area. But develop the product to a certain point where your metrics are okay and you are certain that now it's getting okay because this was a like like i planned too early to go into the market and i completely failed that's why i would just need more plan uh, to do a deeper product development with let's say five customers that's fine for for this area but of course it depends on which area you are if you have a product which is just let's say making revenue in a year per year of 1000 euro, of course you need more money and more customers. And then um, develop with them uh, until they are willing to pay for you. And then you have the right product market fit and then jump to the VCs. And that's all I have for you. So I'm really curious about your questions. <laughs> Thanks Andreas, that, that, that was a nice round of of your journey, I, um, I think, uh, yeah, we know each other for like a couple of years now. And um, I think I've seen you grow. And this is quite a tremendous story. And I'm happy to have you here and share it. Um, and I also want to promote um, your personal networking room and um, want to thank you here um, for that information. And probably also want to want to focus on the networking room uh, options here for everyone uh, still here we've we've switched tactics to go from hangout and google to microsoft um this is due to some privacy reasons um this is also a test for us to to use this and um would be happy if everyone takes advantage of it um if not that's okay too um and um i'm, I'm very thankful that everyone here joined and um maybe ben as well you want to say a few words um, in order to close close this event for for now here and um, yeah to welcome everyone aboard yeah thank you so much I mean so you said everything um, I'm happy now to connect with the startups I think we saw a great variety and I think that's uh, quite quite interesting also for the partners for the network we saw companies that are quite early stage figuring out their prototype um, you know not on the market yet um, and then, of course, we saw companies that are on the market that are actually making revenues. And then, of course, we have one exception with a company that is actually like a grown up uh, and is entering the German market. So I think it's a great variety of startups. Really interesting. And yeah, I'm just uh, uh, last words. Uh, um, feel free to join uh, the, the video chats now um, uh, and get to know the startups, the founders. Ask them the hard questions you maybe not want to ask uh, in the big audience. <laughs> so, yeah, feel free. Um, I'm happy to work with you guys and um, for those who are leaving us now, have a nice evening and thank you so much and see you soon. Bye bye and yeah. see you in the chats. Bye. Bye bye guys. Thank you.